This is from the Industrial Index. It's 1914. The Industrial Index was a trade pub publication that, that if you were going to be doing a building, you, 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 you didn't advertise, but you acknowledge that it's going to be there and you told the trade that that, that building was coming, going to be constructed and these were the people involved in it and this was the kind of construction it was going to be. So, okay, let's take a look. Um, we'll go, there's the first, there's the second. It says uh, a two-story bungalow frame, Atlanta, Georgia, Leela Ro Miss Leela Ross Wilburn, 305 Peters uh, Street, construction by day labor. Okay, next one. Uh, uh, Peters Building. Uh, this person in the Peters Building, it, it was a builder, will erect a bungalow. Plans have been prepared by Miss Henrietta C. Dozier. At that time, she was in the Hurt Building by that time. She, she left it. the uh, P Peters Building. This is 1914. So, and then we see another one. Guy Webb has plans by Miss Leela Ross Wilburn, Peter's building for two-story frame dwelling, blah, blah. I think that's it. So, we knew that, and then Dozier left two years later. So, so they were working on similar projects, even though um, Dozier was was more into the classical uh, commercial architecture and government architecture. So from 1914 on, uh, 1916, excuse me, until 1940, Wilburn was the first, the only person really doing that. Um, I, but 1914. Just want to show you this real quick. This is on the National Registers. It, it's at the end of 11th Street on Piedmont Park. And it's a beautiful building. It won an Urban Design Award back in 2000 something. And, and it's on the National Register and it's now called the Wilburn House Condominiums. It was originally called the Piedmont Park Apartments. And she designed this. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous building and it's been so beautifully restored. Same year as her first plan book. And uh, these are some of the houses. I don't know if they're, uh, if these are on any of the, the posters, but she started her practice solo and began in the MAK district again, a historic district now, in Indicator, near where she lived. So, this is on Adams Street. This is on Adams Street. You've got, a, a, you know, two different kinds. You've got the Craftsman Bungalow, and you've got the two-story. Uh, the neighborhoods, the in-town neighborhoods were... My son just walked in. Hi, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's go back. This is in uh, Inman Park. It's on Elizabeth Street. It's a beautiful building. Um, and the actual plans, the tissue drawings, are in the Atlanta History Center of this building. That's very exciting to, to see that. And then in 1914, she also put out her first plan book. It had 80 plans for houses, and it, um, it also had 37 advertisements in it. And think about that. Talk about business acumen. She was able to finance the thing and put, put it out there with her plans and this is the house that my son, who just walked in, grew up in, in Ansley Park, on the Prado, right here. So, 
that's part of my personal story, but it also shows she was real aware of the technologies at the time. We're talking about face, face brick. And in some of her plan books, she talks about you can afford a brick house, even though you don't think you can, because you can use face brick. In other words, you can use half the amount of brick you need. And therefore, it'll cost less. She was always up to date on technologies. Uh, so she was a, a, what we call a lifelong learner now. You know, um, so, and this this is interesting. It says that the uh, Leg Brick Company is the only high-grade impervious face brick manufactured in the South. The only shale face brick manufactured in the state of Georgia. She knew these people. She worked with these people. She went up and down the elevator with these people. You know, so. She learned how to make her contacts work and to, to be involved in the mall as, a, as an architect. This, is, this, is, this was a lovely house. It's still there. And uh, later on, we decided that we wanted to update it and make it a little modern. So we asked Henry, Henry Hova and John Busby, uh, Hova Daniels Busby, to put an atrium in it take off the porch and put an atrium in it. And it's a lovely, it's a lovely redo of the house, but the bones of the house are still there and it's all good. Other neighborhoods, lots of her houses started getting built. This is, uh, uh, this is in Druid Hills. We're just gonna flip through some of these. This is on Myrtle Street in, in, in Midtown. You've seen a lot of these kinds of houses, beautiful houses. This is, uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but this was the first plan book, Southern Homes and Plan Books. Uh, came out in 1914. Then a couple years later, well, about six years later, Brick and Colonial Homes came out. It's interesting when she did this house I mean, when she did the, when she published this book, self-publisher, we talk about that a lot nowadays. Every photograph in that building, every every plan was accompanied by a photograph of a built building. So by 1914, she had 80 buildings that were built in these neighborhoods. That's quite remarkable, I think. Um, and then she decided she was go, going to go into the plan book business and use it this way. And so these are, these are eight of the nine. I can count. It's not nine, but I'll show you how it works. <laughs> um, and in the front of the book, we list all the plan books. And Agnes Scott has them all. So you can go over there. You can, uh, you, you can look online at all, all the ones that are digitized by... The M.A.K. and Agnes Scott. And um, the next one was Brick and Colonial Homes in the early 20s. And then um, Ideal Homes of Today. Then uh, Houses in Good Taste. And then the, fourth, the fifth one that is missing was called New Homes of Quality. Because we have pages from it, but we don't have the cover. So I'm just telling you that. <laughs> and then after... After World War II, basically, there was a, another movement that happened in the country. Uh, we, we wanted small, low-cost homes because we were building out farms and things that had been turned into, that were being turned into subdivisions and, uh, and suburbs. So you get the whole history of the house in America in these plan books. Then 60 good new homes. Don't you love the titles? They're fabulous. Uh, ranch and colonial homes, the beginning of the modern era, you know, and a different configuration. She, she ran with it. She kept learning this stuff and doing this stuff, and then brand new homes. The only thing I could think about was I wondered why it wasn't N-U instead of N-E-W, but that was one of the typographical um, 
design things that was happening. We were, we were playing with letters, you know, using phonetic sounds. Sort of a new way. Um, so her, her trajectory coincides and tracks right with the rise of Decatur and Atlanta's early neighborhoods and throughout this history all the way into the 1960s when we had uh, ranch and then, uh, hold on a minute here. Mind, got talking too much. What she said in this first plan book, and this will be true regardless of the style, uh, she did three things. She said she specifically claimed the South as her territory. She was a Southern architect. Uh, she claimed the middle class as her market. And she stated her ethic of functional beauty. In other words, you don't have to have the McMansion. You can have a McMansion if you want. You can get a, an architect who'll do that for you. But I'm interested in spreading the word about these other styles that are ex accessible to the middle class. And when you think of that first book, and we'll just run through the rest of these, it was copyrighted. So these are the things that she had to do to put out the book, the first book. She had to secure the national copyright to book designing, writing engaging content, photographing the houses. She talks about her Kodak a lot. Uh, and uh, acquiring advertisers in the first home building arena to fund the first publications and developing an extensive marketing plan for the book in Atlanta and throughout the Southeast. Great achievements. Here's another, here's another um, page from Southern Homes and Bungalows, the first one, which again shows, uh, whoops, sorry. See it says the Peters Building here? She kept her office there for all her life. So again, making those connections, keeping them together. A lovely bungalow at the bottom. Uh, this is the part of the marketing, which I think is fabulous. Um, I'd like to set the new five cents. Yeah, yeah. We're, uh, we're in a different era, aren't we? Well, here it is. Okay, here we go. This is from 1914. It's the year. Um, she, uh, she advertised this in um, an ad for the bride. It was a magazine that was put out, for the bride. This is the domestic movement. This is where the, woman's, the woman is in charge of the house, you know. She promoted that. She got that right. But look here, it says, have drawn plans for more than 20, 1,200 homes in the South. She didn't say in Decatur, she, didn't, she said in the South. Um, and she tells you about, you know, how much, uh, how much the cost is. Beautiful practical and inexpensive bungalows and two-story houses costing, and this was the range that she was using there to build. Uh, so she started her mail order business this way and she advertised it. 
And here's another one of the advertisement places. This is in the Industrial Index, again, that trade publication here. And again, she says, send for my handsome book of plans. <laughs> this book contains photos, four plans, and description of nearly, nearly 100 beautiful, practical, and inexpensive bungalows and two-story houses, cost to bill, complete blueprint, Blueprint plans, she used the Atlanta Blueprint Company. Details and specifications, when ordered from this book, only $5 to $10, have drawn plans for over 1,200 southern homes. Peter's building. It's a great copy. You know, if you're in, in the marketing business, this is great copy. This is a great way to... Um, to advertise and market your product. She didn't shy away from that. She grabbed it and ran with it. And this is, again, was the first book. The others do the same thing, basically. This is uh, from the second book. This is Brick and Colonial Homes. This is in Druid Hills. There it is. Can you see it? There. And the plan numbers are there, and the floor plans. Now, during the same time, when we're getting into the 20s now, um, she was also, she basically became exclusively a, an architect of, of houses and that's what she's known for, but she did do other things, and she did at least 10 apartment buildings. Uh, these ones are, I think, very neat. Uh, this is in, um, this is on Piedmont, uh, 690 Piedmont Road. Just showing you again some of the earlier stuff that was built in, a lot of Architects did this when they were starting up their business. This was 19, just inserting this so you know that she not only accepted a challenge, she, she designed things that were outside her scope, you might say. This is the Gordon Street Baptist Church in the West End. I think there are many houses in the West End that need to be identified by Wilbur, you know, as Wilburn houses. That's a whole nother thing that can happen, hopefully as a result of this book and the interest. Um, this is interesting. Uh, a real good friend of ours, Renee Brown Bryant, did a search through all the, she's a genealogist, and she did this search for me, and she found all this stuff that Wilbur was doing on the side, you know. <laughs> And this was a design for the Vealey Motor, Motor Vehicle Company. Um, and, if can get it right here. Uh, Miss Leela Ross Wilburn is the architect of the building, and R.M. Walker is the contractor. Cheatham Brothers negotiated the lease to the motor company. And there's her signature there Leela Ross Wilburn, architect. 305 Peters Building, Atlanta. Uh, this, this, was to, this was built in the area, I don't know if you know where St. Luke's Church is on Peach Street down from uh, uh, the, uh, Emory, Midtown. Um, a lot of that's been cleared away now, but it was in that section. You can sort of, you can, you can imagine it being there because it fits in. And, and this is really, this is in 1919, but in 1908, one of her first commissions, or 1909, one of her first commissions was by a woman, actually, who wanted a YMCA building built in what is now Woodward Academy campus, which was the Georgia Military Academy. So this is a beautiful YMCA building with gym and, you know, all the things it had in it for, for the boys. Again, early stuff. 
1920, we know what happened in 1920. Women got the right to vote. Okay, so that's part of the deal. But also part of the deal was that architects needed to register in the state of Georgia to be architects. Before that, you didn't have to register, you just did it. And uh, so she very much, this is her, uh, this is her registration certificate. Be it known that Leela Ross Wilburn has given satisfactory evidence uh, that she has the qualifications required by law and is hereby authorized to employ in the state of Georgia the title of architect number 29, the first registered woman architect in the state of Georgia, and the 29th registered architect in the state of Georgia. Oops. Now, in 1961, she died in 1967, five days shy of her 82nd birthday. But in 1961, she was in her uh, mid-70s. She received a certificate of membership in SARA, which is the Society of American Registered Architects. She was never a member of the AIA. That's another thing that needs to be understood, but I think somebody needs to find that out, if they can. I couldn't, but surely somebody can. Um, I think it's real interesting. It says, having given evidence of his qualifications as a registered architect. And, uh, this is 1961. We thought we, we'd done that, you know? We've been there, done that, you know? Well, there we go. But she always said she was the 29th registered architect. She always signed her, her drawings that way. Now, in the 20s, uh, there was a big rush to own your own home, which is the American way. And uh, the, um, uh, there was an own your own home exhibition in Atlanta. And she gave away plans. Let's see if I can get it here. You know, I skipped over something, but I'm going to insert it in here. Um, that was 1920, but previous to that, there was World War I, remember? And for a year, she, she enlisted in the, um, the um, as a civil servant, as a draftsman at Fort McPherson to help draft and build, uh, draft the plans for the building of storage units and things like that, that they needed. That was for a year. And she commuted back and forth on the, the streetcar. The streetcar ran like where Marta runs now. So, um, and then she came back, she kept her lease at the Peters building and she kept her lease and then she um, 